Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight we'll get an update from Dan Sutherland. He's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Department of Homeland Security. Then we'll discuss the crisis in Darfur with Anita Sharma. She's Executive Director of a group called Enough. And finally, we'll take an in-depth look at the capture and release of 15 British sailors by the Iranian government. What was it about? And what does it portend, if anything, for the future? But first, our story of the week. Well, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi returns to the U.S. today after completing a five-nation tour of the Middle East with visits to Israel, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia. She and her bipartisan delegation broke new ground, ruffled a few feathers, and won praise across the region. In addition to her official meetings, the visit was notable for its positive contribution to U.S. public diplomacy so badly needed in the Arab world. For example, bringing Congressman Keith Ellison, the first Muslim member of Congress, and Nick Rahal, the dean of the Arab American delegation in Congress, sent positive messages of inclusion. Her spending Palm Sunday in Jerusalem with Palestinian business leaders, learning from them about the hardships of living under occupation, was deeply appreciated, as was the delegation's afternoon visit to the Souk Hamadiyya in Syria, sent a message to the Syrian people that there are Americans who care about engaging with their country and its people. In Saudi Arabia, the scene of the first woman speaker of the House of Representatives sitting in the chair reserved for the head of the Mejlis Ashura was both a sign of respect for that institution while also sending a message about the empowerment of women. Not everyone was happy, however. Vice President Cheney had rather harsh words for Speaker Pelosi's visit. Here's what he said, I'm obviously disappointed. I think it's a fact of bad behavior on her part. I wish she hadn't done it. But from my initial conversations with Palestinians and Saudis and others with whom she met, Americans owe a debt of gratitude to Speaker Pelosi. Hers was behavior we could all learn from. Well, our first guest is Dan Sutherland. He's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He's a longtime civil rights attorney with 14 years of service at the Department of Justice. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Thank you. He testified uh, last month before the U.S. Senate mm -hmm. um, uh, Committee that has oversight over Homeland Security. And I just want to do an excerpt of Q, a question from Senator Lieberman and your answer. Here it is. To the best of your uh, knowledge, based on the interaction you've had with the Muslim American community, what's the attitude of the overwhelming majority who are obviously law-abiding good americans contributing to the country peaceful etc toward the islamist extremists i've had these conversations a number of times yeah. with muslims around the country and, and, and arab americans as well they get lumped in there of course you know um the vast majority of arab americans in this country are christian not muslim but it's, um, it's a very important fact that most people don't appreciate they feel perplexed i've asked why do you think they do the things that they do and and they don't know any better than any of the rest of us. And the last thing I wrote, it, wrote down is um, they don't feel that that's part of us. They're not part of our community that's gone. As, right? They were never part of us. It has nothing to do with us. Well, that's a key point. And I'm glad that Senator Lieberman asked it, and you answered it as you did. The question is, it's not well understood. No. I mean, I, I still get, um, uh, Bef when I speak on a talk radio show or mm -hmm. when I uh, speak out against a, a practice of the government I, I don't like, uh, I get you you people don't condemn the terrorists, uh, you're, you're with the terrorists. A uh, guy on CNN, Glenn Beck, um, recently challenging uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, uh, asking him to prove that he was not one of them. Um, what, can, what can be done other than speaking out as you did before the, the Senate? Uh, what else can Homeland Security do to, to make the point uh, vigorously and, and emphatically that uh, this is a very different community? Well, that's the real key message coming out of this testimony. You played a clip of my testimony. There were 10 senators, including some of the most prominent in, in the country, and a cabinet secretary and our chief of intelligence who were making all the points that you were making. Um, you know, Senator Lieberman, who's such a, you know, strong supporter of the war in Iraq and strong supporter of Israel, you know, making the point that Muslims and Arab Americans in this country are part of the fabric of the country. Secretary Chertoff, you know, the, the, he's a tough judge 
and the head of security making, you know, Homeland Security here in our country, making the point repeatedly that Muslims in America are part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need to engage more Muslims. And, and senator after senator making the same point. That's the real key to that, you know, to that story, I think. I, I know that some of the groups have, have urged you and, and others in the government to do joint efforts mm -hmm. um, to go public and, and make this point to, in effect, uh, help inoculate the community against hate crime, something that I, I know keeps law enforcement way too busy. Mm -hmm. uh, three guys in, in jail for threatening my life and, and, and others. Uh, there have actually been people murdered, mm -hmm. uh, dozens actually. But but question is, what would stop Homeland Security from doing a public event with, with our communities to make that point? Well, we've, we've done it. Um, you know, the week of 9-11, we held a, an event. We held it at the National Press Club. It was myself, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, a senior official of the FBI, along with a number of people from the communities. And we talked about the positive, constructive role that these communities have played with the government since 9-11. And you know, Jim, the, the press coverage that we got on that was almost nothing. Yeah. And it's the same as this hearing that, that you know, that, that, you know, these statements, I mean, Secretary Chertoff told the Senate that Congressman Ellison, he felt, did the right thing when he was sworn in on the Quran. He said, I was sworn in on a Jewish Bible, and I feel that, that the Congressman did the right thing. That would, would have been, you would think, huge news, never reported. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that we have to confront well, is dealing with the media. It's a challenge that remains. Because Absolutely. in the advent, uh, the unfortunate, tragic um, advent of, a, of another uh, attack in the country, uh, I fear that the communities would be once again targeted. Uh, they, they're targeted without any attacks. Um, and the burden, I think, on all of us would mm -hmm. be even greater uh, than it was before. But I think these are laying good ground, okay. uh, you know, good, good foundation where, where we're, we're making good, positive steps. We have to keep doing it, Secretary Chertoff said that in the hearing that we need to keep making these statements. He's looking for more opportunities to give speeches. He was just in London this week where he was asked about the differences between the Muslim community in the United States and the Muslim community in Europe. He gave a thoughtful answer about the uh, integration and the prosperity of the American Muslim community and how uh, plugged in they are and connected and uh, their, their role in making the country more secure in the future. That hit four or five major British papers. So we just have to mm -hmm. keep looking for these opportunities. Well, I commend you for that. And, I, and I, you know, it, it, it's been important, the role that, that your office has played. But there's a, a part of your testimony I want to take issue with. I want okay. to raise some questions with you about it. You said we need to challenge community leaders to spread understanding about our security mission. There are times we have to deport somebody. There are times we have to question people, et cetera. We need community leaders to explain this. I don't disagree with you about that right. at all, but that job becomes more difficult yeah. um, when there are uh, security programs that we really don't get, don't right. understand, right. and can't support, right. like the special registration exactly. program, sure. like the watch list, and it's assortment of names that is simply not filtered mm -hmm. uh, enough and therefore causes uh, uh, unnecessary uh, burdens on, on, on some people. Um, and these persistent rumors about mass detention centers, et cetera. T talk to me a little about that. What, what can we do to make the, the, the conversation that we continue to have go away? I mean, how can we mm -hmm. correct these programs yeah. so that the necessary programs, the ones that we yeah. do support, become more defensible? Well, you, I, I think you're already doing it in, in a lot of respects. For example, on watch lists, when, when we as a government have come up with new plans, for example, we just come up with a new system to, do, to um, ensure there's redress for travelers. In other words, somebody's having a problem with their name on a watch list, it's a misidentification, there's a system now to try and correct that. Your organization and a number of, of leading organizations here issue public statements congratulating the department and in effect encouraging us, elbowing us to do more in the area. That's an example of where the system works the right way. You pushed us on policy. We saw that your point was right. When we made some steps, you congratulated us and elbowed us to do some more. And so I think that is working well. We need to continue the process of it, no let's, doubt. Let's